Hi class, um, as promised, um, here is your endocrine um, voiceover PowerPoint. So we will get going on this. This is Kelly Alabozic. Um, readings in Lewis, so they're all from chapter 49. We're going to go over acromegaly, hypopituitarism, diabetes insipidus, um, SIADH, or syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, and pheochromocytoma. So first we're going to start off with disorders of the pituitary gland and that's going to be acromegaly and hypopituitarism. So remember like we talked about the endocrine system it's made up of several organs and glands that are involved in the creation of secretions of hormones. Um, so when we have problems arise with regulation of hormones it can, act, it can affect many aspects of a patient's life. Um, so I know I asked in class, you know, what issues with the body can unregulated hormones create? And I know a lot of you said metabolism, um, electrolyte imbalances, it can be temperature, nutrition, fluid regulation, skin integrity, um, growth and fertility issues, as well as um, psychological responses too. So anxiety and depression are big ones there as well. Um, so talking about the pituitary gland, um, that is known as the master gland of the endocrine system. And the pituitary gland secretes growth hormone, or GH, um, prolactin, tropic hormones, um, thyroid stimula stimulating hormones, follicle stimulating hormones, luteinizing hormone. Um, they have, you know, a large effect on growth, sexual maturation, or sexual reproduction, metabolism, stress responses, and fluid balance. So acromegaly. So four of every one million adults in the U.S. are diagnosed annually. Um, so really not many. Um, and this really tends to happen between the ages of 40 to 45 years old. And this is um, caused by an overproduction of growth hormone, which is created in the anterior pituitary gland. Um, this often occurs due to benign um, growth hormone secreting adenoma or a hormone secreting tumor. And excess growth hormone actually results in overgrowth of soft tissues, um, bones in the hands, feet, and face. So signs and symptoms, clinical manifestations. Um, the patient you'll find will have thickening and enlargement of the bony and soft tissue on the face, feet, and head. Um, they can develop proximal muscle weakness and joint pain, which ranges from mild to crippling. Carpal tunnel syndrome, um, tongue enlargement. They can develop a deepened voice. Um, that can also be due to hypertrophy of the vocal cords. Um, you'll notice also with the tongue enlargement, it can result in dental and speech problems. Um, sleep apnea can occur. Thick leathery skin becomes oily with increased acne um, and also vision changes from pressure on the optic nerve. So changes like this are results from excess growth hormone and it can occur actually very slowly over time, over many, many years. A lot of patients don't even notice um, until very further down the road as well as family and friends. That's how slowly this occurs. It can go unnoticed for quite some time. Um, so like we talked about vision changes, pressure on the optic nerve. So again, this is actually from um, pressure from a tumor. So the tumor in the pituitary gland is very, very close to the optic nerve. And pressure on the optic nerve um, will actually cause loss of vision, typically in the outer hemispheres of the eyes. So patients can actually lose peripheral vision. Um, signs and symptoms continued. Um, headaches can be very common in these patients. Um, growth hormone anti antagonizes the action of insulin which means that manifestations of diabetes can occur. So the patient can experience um, ex you know, excessive thirst, polydipsia, excessive urination, polyuria. Um, they can be prone to cardiovascular disease, again, like we talked about diabetes and colorectal cancer, um, joint pain and deformities, as well as peripheral neuropathies. 
Um, a life expectancy is typically reduced by five to 10 years in patients with acromegaly. acromegaly. And again, just a, more of like a visual here, um, patients with this disease have increased frontal bossing, so they'll have more of a defined um, thickened forehead as well as brow, and they'll develop a brow furrow. Enlargement of the base of the nose, um, thickening of the nasolabial sulcus, so that area, um, that kind of that crease between your lip and your cheek. Um, thickening of the lips, uh, parotid hypertrophy, so the neck actually kind of gets a little bit enlarged. Um, the patient tends to lose um, oval facial features and the chin becomes more um, visible um, and enlarged. And just some um, I think from what these are before and afters, but just the changes in facial features that you see in patients with acromegaly. So you can definitely see, definitely see both um, more of a defined thickened nose in both of these patients. Same thing with the forehead and the brow, um, the lips for sure, and chin. So diagnostics, how do we diagnose patients with acromegaly? So getting a good history and physical, of course. Um, and then the, the big um, plasma identifier is insulin-like growth factor one. So IGF-1 levels. Um, those levels will be elevated. And IGF-1 levels mediate the peripheral actions of growth hormone. So as growth hormone levels rise, so does IGF-1. Um, growth hormone is released in a pulsatile fashion. So it's really, really important to take um, multiple levels of blood um, because like we talked about in class, um, hormone, these hormone levels are like a roller coaster. They may be down to normal if you're taking one blood level and then the next blood level, they may be super, super high. So that's why it's important to get multiple um, serial labs just to pick up on this, because if you just get one, we will not probably pick up on this diagno diagnosis. Um, growth hormone responds to the oral glucose tolerance test. Um, and during this glucose test, growth hormone concentration normally falls because glucose inhibits growth hormones. But in acromegaly, growth hormone levels will not fall and in some cases may rise, okay? So we'll actually see a rise in growth hormone with a oral glucose to tolerance test. Um, MRIs and CT scans with contrast can definitely pick up um, pituitary tumors and eye exams, of course, because we want to, you know, pick up if there's any um, peripheral vision loss because that will be pressure from a pituitary tumor pressing, pressing down on the optic nerve. So nursing, what do we do for these patients? Um, so our overall goal is to return the growth hormone levels back to normal, of course. And treatment depends on the age, um, the tumor size. Um, the number one treatment of choice is a hypophysectomy, so that's actually total removal of the pituitary gland. Um, it results in immediate reduction of growth hormone levels. Um, so growth hormone levels will decrease within a few weeks, as well as the IGF-1 levels will drop within a few weeks. Um, patients with larger tumors um, or growth hormone levels that are, that are greater than 45 may need radiation therapy or drug therapy prior to surgery. And then there's drug therapy. Um, this can be an option for patients whose surgery maybe did not go well or did not result in a decrease in growth hormone levels. Um, so the um, main drug of choice for this is octreotide, also known as sandostatin. And this medication reduces growth hormone levels. It is given by a sub-Q injection three times a week. Um, there's also a long-acting option, which is available IM, and that is given every four weeks. Um, typically, growth hormone levels are measured every two weeks just to make sure that the drug therapy is working. 
Also another um, type of drug are dopamine agonists. And some examples are those are um, bromocryptine and cabergoline. And these reduce the secretion of growth hormone from the tumor. It can be used in conjunction with sandostatin if complete remission has not been achieved. It is a growth hormone antagonist. Um, so it also can reduce the effect of growth hormone by blocking liver production of IGF-1. What's very helpful, um, providers usually like to see serial photographs, you know, showing improvement of facial features and helps the patient with body image as well. Um, and also fatigue and sleep problems may still persist after an, a patient has had surgery, the hypophysectomy. Um, and then this video kind of helps just pull it all together, gives us a little bit more um, of A and P and um, signs and symptoms as well as diagnostics and treatment. Okay, um, moving right along to hypopituitarism. Um, this is a rare disorder. Typically, if there is a deficiency in only one pituitary hormone, it is called selective hypopituitarism. Um, but if there is actually more a deficiency of more than one um, or total failure of the gland, um, this is called panhypopituitarism. So it is a decrease, decrease in one or more pituitary hormones. So not an increase like acromegaly, now we're decreasing. So kind of the opposite here. So the most common hormone deficiency involved um, are growth hormones and gonadotropins. Gonadotropins are more like the sexual hormone. The most common cause is from a pituitary tumor. Um, also what can cause this is autoimmune issues, um, infections, destruction of a pituitary gland, and that can either be done by trauma or radiation. Um, anterior pituitary hormone deficiencies can lead to end organ failure. So that needs to be, you know, fixed right away. Um, TSH and ACTH deficiencies are definitely life-threatening. And ACTH can lead to acute adrenal insufficiency and hypovolemic shock um, from sodium and water depletion. So signs and symptoms of hypopituitarism. A patient can develop a headache and that's typically an early symptom. Um, they will experience weakness and fatigue, a decrease in axillary and pubic hair, dry pale skin, a loss of libido and menstrual irregularities, um, visual changes. Again, the same thing, decreased peripheral vision, of course, because we have that tumor pressing down on the optic nerve. Uh, loss of smell, nausea, vomiting, and seizures. And diagnostics for hypopituitarism are, again, getting a really good history and physical. MRI and CT scanning, just to pick up on that um, adenocarcinoma in the pituitary. And also direct measurement of pituitary hormones. An example would be TSH. So our job, nursing. Um, how can we make these patients better? So again, surgery is probably number one, so the hypophysectomy. Um, also radiation therapy. And again, if the, if the tumor tends to be a little bit too big before surgery, they may want to do a little bit of radiation therapy before. And then these patients will need to be um, on lifelong hormone therapies. So um, they may need growth hormone. They may be, need to be on corticosteroids or a thyroid hormone. So the first one we're going to talk about is somatotropin recumbent human growth hormone. So this is one of the lifelong hormone therapies. Um, and this helps the patients have increased energy. They have more of a lean body mass, feeling of well-being and improved body image. Um, it helps with fluid retention, swelling in the hands and feet, as well as joint pain and headache. And this is given daily by a sub-Q injection. There is also estrogen, estrogen and progesterone replacement therapy, especially for gonadal deficiencies in women. Um, so, so for more of like a, a sexual deficiency. And then testosterone would be for gonadal deficiencies in men. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about a hypophysectomy. So this is removal of the pituitary gland, and it's definitely a treatment of choice more for this smaller type of tumors. And again, if they're larger, they may want to do radiation beforehand. Um, and it is a transphenoidal approach, so it actually goes up through the nair endoscopically. Um, and again, when this gland is removed, all hormones from the pituitary gland are lost. So um, Patients with hypopituitarism will need lifelong hormone replacement therapy. Um, so thyroid hormone, sex hormone, glucocorticoids. And radiation can reduce the size of a tumor, like we talked about, you know, before surgery, if the tumor is too large. And this is just a, you know, good picture of an endoscope going up through the nair. Um, making an incision more so in the sinuses and getting into that pituitary gland and removing both the tumor and the gland. And this is a little bit of a video to show you a better visual. And then surgical nursing care. Um, so, you know, we definitely want to assess for any formation of hematomas or bleeding, okay, and always look for signs and symptoms of bleeding whether it be visual or if we need to monitor the vital signs. Um, and vital signs, remember, if we're bleeding way too much and we're actually going into hypovolemia, we'll have a low blood pressure and a high tachycardic heart rate. Um, always assess for compression of the optic nerve, and that's through peripheral vision, visual acuity. Um, also, we want to monitor pupillary responses and report any changes. Um, we really don't want any visual deterioration to be permanent, okay? So we need to make sure to check, on, check up on that um, and be astute as possible with that. Always monitor for cerebral spinal fluid leaks, okay? Cerebral spinal fluid will be clear, um, and you'll be seeing that coming from the nair. And it's really important to test for cerebral spinal fluid using a um, dipstick to check for glucose. Um, and if that glucose level is greater than 30, um, it's definitely probably positive for CSF. Um, patients that are leaking cerebral spinal fluid are at greater risk for an infection such as meningitis. But typically, providers will um, put a petroleum-coated gauze in, in the nair into the sinus area. Um, they'll like that removed after about 24 hours until they, you know, know that there's a lesser concern for bleeding. Um, if there's more of a concern for bleeding or a CSF leak, they may le want to leave that gauze placed more for like two to three days. Um, of course, we want to avoid blowing the nose up to 48 hours post-op. Um, if the patient experiences like a persistent severe headache, it may indicate a CSF leak into the sinuses. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, typically, CSF leaks usually resolve in about three days or 72 hours. And that's actually just with simple head elevation um, and bed rest. If, if leaks do persist more than three days, more than 72 hours, um, some providers may recommend a um, lumbar puncture or spinal tap. And that is actually done to relieve a little bit of pressure in the brain. Um, and will decrease uh, cerebral spinal fluid leaks. Um, again, always elevating that head um, to, you know, 30 degree angle, and that is going to help with any CSF leaks. Again, monitoring pupils, vital signs. We want to do neuro checks on the patient. Um, strict INOs. Coughing and deep breathing, but just being careful with that, um, not to disrupt the surgical site. Um, gentle mouth care about every four hours. We do want to keep that surgical area clean, um, but we do want to avoid toothbrushing for at least 10 days to protect the suture line. And uh, um, following any hormone replacement therapy that the provider has ordered. So, Going a little bit off topic, but still involved with the pituitary issues, um, more so with pituitary surgery. Um, transient diabetes insipidus can actually come about through pituitary surgery. 
So um, transient DI may occur due to the loss of antidiuretic hormone. Um, ADH is typically stored in the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So when we take that pituitary gland out, we're going to have loss of ADH. So fluid and, elect and electrolyte problems can occur, which leads us to transient DI. Um, also, cerebral edema can occur due to manipulation of the pituitary during surgery. Um, DI may be permanent after surgery. We definitely need to monitor urine output and measure specific gravity just to make sure that we're ruling out diabetes insipidus. Um, it is important to monitor an output of more than 200 mLs an hour um, for more than three consecutive hours because that would show polyuria. And if there's a specific gravity less than 1.005, that could also, also show signs of transient diabetes insipidus. Also, if the patient has extreme thirst, high sodium levels, um, and DI is treated giving desmopressin. So, you know, if we can find this as early as possible after surgery, we're hoping that it won't be permanent and we can fix this issue. Um, food replacement might be needed to avoid hypovolemia because remember if they do and in, go into transient diabetes insipidus they're putting out a lot of urine and we may not be putting in as much as they're putting out and then um, SIADH can also happen post-surgery so this can occur after intracranial surgery um, it typically occurs later than DI would so on the fourth post-op day um, again, SIADH can occur due to manipulation of the pituitary. So as nurses, we need to keep that in mind. Um, and then these patients will have fluid retention. And this is caused by circulating ADH. So the patient will get dilutional hyponatremia. So sodium levels will go down. They'll typically be less than 125. And we'll notice that the patient will have a headache, vomiting, and decreased level of consciousness. So that's it with the pituitary disorders, and we're going to move into ADH disorders. So we're going to talk more about diabetes insipidus and SIADH. Okay, so first we're going to talk about diabetes insipidus. Um, and this is caused by, again, a deficiency of ADH, or actually a decreased renal response to ADH. So not only can this be pituitary gland related, because we have a deficiency of ADH. Um, this can also be renal related um, because there's interference with ADH and the synthesis of it and the the kidneys are not just are not synthesizing ADH correctly. Um, so diabetes insipidus leads to fluid and electrolyte imbalances so we'll have increased urine output as well as an increased plasma osmolality. So we'll see high sodium levels with this. Um, central DI is most common, um, also known as neurogenic, and that's um, interference with ADH synthesis, meaning that it could be caused by brain tumors, head injury, brain surgery, um, and then there's a nephrogenic, again, to the kidneys, so there's inadequate response to ADH. So it's not, the kidneys are not synthesizing ADH correctly they're not noticing an adequate presence of ADH. So this can be from renal damage, renal disease, as well as a medication, um, psychological medication, lithium, can cause nephrogenic DI. Um, so what happens is we have a decrease in ADH. That leads to a decrease in water reabsorption in the renal tubules. This leads to decreased intravascular volume, which, which leads to excessive urine output and high sodium levels. So how do these patients present? So onset is typically acute um, with excess fluid loss. Um, the patient will be extreme, have extreme thirst, polydipsia. They'll be, um, having large amounts of urine output, polyuria, two to 20 liters a day. Um, we'll notice on the labs um, for urine that they'll have a low specific gravity of less than 1.005. 
a urine osmolality less than 100, and a serum osmolality more than 295. Serum sodium levels will typically be above 145, and that's really just pure water loss from the, in the kidneys. The patient may um, come across as fatigued and weak, um, but we really need to correct the sodium levels because uncorrected hypernatremia can lead to brain shrinkage and intracranial bleeding. Uh, most patients typically compensate for fluid loss by drinking large amounts of water so that the serum osmolality stays normal or is moderately increased, but we really need to be aware of severe dehydration because um, this can result if oral intake is not keeping up with the urine output, which is very typical. Um, vital signs will show as like a hypovolemic shock, like, you know, for dehydration. So we'll be hypotensive, we'll be tachycardic. Um, also, just clinical manifestations post any intracranial surgery. Um, there is an acute phase, interphase, and third phase. Um, the acute phase after intracranial surgery is abrupt onset of polyuria. Um, interphase is when urine volume normalizes. And third phase is um, means that central DI can become permanent. So this is typically 10 to 14 days post-surgery. Um, central DI, you know, typically from head trauma um, or uh, a tumor or surgery, typically improves a treatment of underlying problems or causes. Um, onset of nephrogenic, even the symptoms are the same. Um, the same onset and the amount of fluid loss is typically less dramatic with nephrogenic. Diagnostics. So there's, with central DI, we're going to do a water deprivation test. So prior to the test, we're going to get a, um, a baseline body weight. We're going to get a baseline urine osmolality, um, urine volume, and specific gravity. And then what happens is the patient is deprived of water for about 8 to 12 hours. So after that 8 to 12 hours, the patient is given desmopressin sub-Q. Now, if this is a positive test and this is a central DI issue and not a kidney issue, we will have dramatic increase in the urine osmolality from 100 to 600, and we'll see a decrease in urine volume. If this is nephrogenic DI, patients will not have an increase in urine osmolality, so it'll be, you know, above 300, typically. Um, so that's one way to pick apart from central DI to nephrogenic is doing this water deprivation test. Um, also measuring the level of ADH after desmopressin is given. So if it's central DI, the kidneys will respond by concentrating the urine after desmopressin is given. But if the kidneys do not respond to the ADH, then nephrogenic is likely the cause. So nursing for DI, early detection is huge, okay, because we want to fix this problem as soon as possible. I mean, we have fluid electrolyte issues that need to be corrected. Um, maintaining adequate hydration because the patient be can become dehydrated. Um, maintaining fluid and electrolyte levels and balances. Um, if it's central DI, we'll need fluid and hormone therapy. Um, fluids are typically given IV, sometimes or orally if the patient can take down large amounts of water. Um, very typical is a hypotonic saline solution or D5W. And we do need to monitor blood glucose levels if the patient is receiving D5W. Vital signs, we wanted to you know, make sure that the patient is, isn't going into hypovolemic shock, um, making sure that we take a assess the level of consciousness of the patient, especially if our sodium levels are high. 
um, we need to get hourly levels of specific gravity and make sure that we keep a strict INO record. Um, Desmopressin, it's actually an analog of ADH and it's a hormone replacement of choice for central DI. Also, there's aqueous vasopressin, and that's also an ADH replacement drug. There's chlorpropamide and carb um, tyrotol. This actually, these both help decrease the symptoms of thirst in patients. Hormone therapy will have little effect of on the kidneys because it's not, it's just not going to synthesize. It's not going to pick up on the hormones because we're in kidney failure. Um, if it's more nephrogenic, um, a low sodium diet and thiazide diuretics are recommended. So typically a hydrochlorothiazide will be ordered for nephrogenic DI. Um, and then if above is not effective, um, endomethacin can be given, and this is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, um, an NSAID, and this will help increase renal responsiveness to ADH. And this is a nice video pulling it together again of the AMP, the signs and symptoms diagnostics. All right, and that's DI. We're going to move on to Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone, or SIADH. So this is an, actually an increase in ADH or an overproduction of ADH. Um, release of ADH actually despite normal or low plasma osmolarity. This disease actually increases permeability of the distal renal tubules in collecting ducts. So this means there's reabsorption of water into the circulation, which means the patient's actually going to hold on to water and it's not going to be excreted in the urine. Um, extracellular fluid volume will expand and plasma osmolality declines, which means that sodium levels will also decline. So there'll be dilutional hyponatremia. Um, this actually tends to occur most often in older adults. And the most common cause is small cell lung cancer. So kind of putting it together, we have an increase in ADH, which means there's an increase in water reabsorption in the renal tubules, which actually puts water back into the circulation and the patient will hold on to water. This leads to dilutional hyponatremia and decreases serum osmolality. So these are the multiple causes of SIADH. So just take a look over this slide again. And signs and symptoms of SIADH, how does this patient present? So it's going to be the opposite. So we're going to have fluid retention. So we're going to have a lower urine output. We're going to have an increased body weight, probably more concentrated urine. Um, we'll have serum hypoosmolality. We'll have dilutional hyponatremia, so low sodium levels, hypochloremia. Um, the urine, like I said, will be concentrated and will have more of an increased intravascular volume. Um, at first, the patients can have that symptoms of feeling thirsty. Um, they'll typically be short of breath with exertion and fatigued. Um, and just be aware that hyponatremia, low sodium levels, can cause sodium cramping, um, irritability, and headaches. Once below um, 120, we do need to watch for um, vomiting, abdominal cramps, and muscle twitching. Also, cerebral edema can occur, seizures, and coma. And diagnostics. So we need to get serum sodium levels, and they'll typically be less than 135. A serum osmolality will be less than 280, and a urine-specific gravity will be greater than 1.030. Um, also getting simultaneous measurements of urine and serum osmolality, and typically your serum osmolality will be much lower than a urine osmolality in SIADH. So we want to watch for sudden weight gain. Um, they will, there will be no edema, so it's going to be more vascular. 
Um, we really want to watch for low urine output with a high specific gravity, um, taking a look at sodium levels, which they'll be low. Um, monitoring INOs, daily weights, of course, vital signs, um, getting, you know, good heart and lung sounds, making sure there's not any fluid on board in the heart or the lungs. Um, these patients may present more with a higher blood pressure. We want to observe for headaches, seizures, vomiting, um, any decreased neurofunctions. And treatment should always be um, directed at the underlying cause. Um, so if symptoms are mild and the sodium is greater than 125, we'll put the patient on a fluid restriction. So we'll, they'll be on a restriction of 800 to 1 liter a day. Um, so we should see a weight reduction and a rise in sodium if we follow this correctly. And it's important to provide frequent oral care, especially if a patient is on a fluid restriction. Um, and these patients are typically thirsty and also using distractions. A loop diuretic, also known as Lasix, will help promote diuresis. So it'll help take some water off. But we, of course, want to watch for electrolyte levels, especially potassium. Uh, making sure the potassium doesn't decrease too far. Um, there's also demeclocycline, and this actually will help block the effect of ADH on the renal tubules, so it'll dil dilute the urine a little bit more. Um, just watching for seizure and fall precautions, especially with the low sodium levels, um, patients can have confusion um, and also develop seizures. A fun little fact here, but if you position the head of the bed flat or at a 10 degree angle, we'll actually have a little bit more venous return to the heart, which actually increases left atrial filling. And because of the increase in left atrial filling, we'll actually have more of a release of ADH, which will help the symptoms of SIADH. Um, severe hyponatremia is less than 120, so we always need to look out for that. Um, the provider may typically order a sodium um, chloride replacement, um, also known as 3% sodium chloride. But we really do not want to correct hyponatremia too fast. We want to do it slowly. Um, we should not see levels increase more than 8 to 12 in the first 20, 24 hours. Um, but if we go too fast with the 3% sodium, we may have osmotic demyelization syndrome. And this is actually permanent damage to the nerve cells within the brain. So we want to be really careful about that. There's also vasopressor receptor antagonists, and this blocks activity of ADH. Some examples of these are um, conovaptin and tolvaptin. Um, conovaptin is given IV, tolvaptin is given orally. Um, just keep in mind, both of these medications should not be given to patients with liver disease. Um, they tend to worsen liver function. So just a red flag to look out for there. And then a good little video, again, um, showing you, you know, A&P diagnostics, signs and symptoms, treatment for SIADH. And I like this slide here. Um, it just shows you what happens when we have a patient in SIADH with the serum sodium level goes down, um, we'll have low sodium, our serum osmo will go down and our urine osmo goes up. And with diabetes insipidus, we'll have high sodium levels, um, high serum osmo and low serum, excuse me, low urine osmo. I love this slide. It really shows a good visual of the differences between SIADH and DI. So if you remember SI soaked inside, okay, we have a decrease in serum osmolality, which will make our sodium levels decrease. We can have an increased blood pressure because the patient is holding on to fluid. Um, due to the low sodium levels, the patient may have seizures and will have a really thick concentrated urine. And then with DI, dry inside, we have high sodium levels inside. We can typically have a low blood pressure because the patient may be dehydrated. We'll have very, very dilute urine. And again, another good slide showing you, 
you know, the same visual of the differences between SIADH and D DI. And we have good mnemonics on each side. And I think it's really good for you guys to keep reviewing this, this slide as the seven S's and the seven D's. And then there's pheochromocytoma. So this is the last thing we're going to talk about. Um, and this is typically caused by a tumor in the adrenal medulla. And this affects chromaffin cells. So which, when we have chromocell involvement, it can lead to excess production of catecholamines, also known as epinephrine and norepinephrine. So the patients can actually develop a severe hypertension. Um, and if this is left untreated, it's, it's a medical emergency. The, so the patient can develop encephalopathy, diabetes, cardiomyopathy, um, multi-organ death, and, and death itself. Um, this occurs mostly in younger to middle-aged adults. And what we see here with patients with pheochromocytoma is severe hypertension. They'll have a pounding headache. They can have tachycardia with palpitations. Um, as well as sweating. And they can have a unexplained abdominal pain or chest pain. And we'll see a classic triad here. So the patient will have severe headache, they'll have tachycardia and profuse swelling. Um, attacks of pheochromocytoma can actually be induced by trauma, um, any mechanical pressure to the tumor, um, stress, defecation, caffeine, sexual intercourse, smoking, alcohol, um, and also contrast media, opioids, antihypertensives, and, and antidepressants. Um, diagnostic, diagnostics of pheochromocytoma. So um, we'll need to get a measurement of what is called urinary fraction, fractionated metanephrines and also fractionated catecholamines. Okay, so we'll get a measurement of that, those in the urine. We also need to get a measurement of creatinine. And a 24-hour urine collection is best for patients with pheochromocytoma. Um, values are typically increased in 95% of patients with pheochromocytoma. Um, if there is a tumor in the adrenal gland, we'll want to do a CT scan MRI. And what's really, really important is to not palpate the abdomen. Um, this can typically happen. There can be a sudden release of catecholamines. Um, which will lead to severe hypertension. And then nursing for these patients. So typically we're going to have surgical remover of, removal of the tumor. Um, there's treatments A and B. So we have treatment A adrenergic and B adrenergic. These are receptor blockers and um, they're actually required before surgery to help uh, control blood pressure and prevent any hypertension going on in the OR. So A-anginergic receptor blockers are given first, um, 10 to 14 days before surgery. And a few examples of these are doxazosin and prazosin. And then after that, we have a B-adrenergic, which we'll, we can give you know, right up to the day of the surgery. Um, and an example of this is propanolol. And this can help with tachycardia issues and also arrhythmia issues. We want to monitor for orthostatic hyper, hypotension, and remember that is lying, standing, standing. If um, surgery is not an option, there's metyrazine, and this can actually decrease catecholamine production, so it'll decrease the production of epinephrine, norepinephrine. We want to, of course, monitor vital signs, and if you know rest and nutrition is huge for these patients. And typically, a laparoscopic approach is used to remove the tumor on the adrenal gland.